Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on Saturday, January 14th, 2012. This is episode 839. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Ford, featuring all electric and hybrid electric technologies. Learn more about the technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. And by Stamps.com. Nobody likes waiting in line at the post office, especially now. That's why I use and recommend Stamps.com. Buy and print official U.S. postage using your own computer and printer, and you'll never have to go to the post office again. For my special offer, visit Stamps.com, click the radio microphone, and use the promo code TECHGUY. Well, hello. How are you? Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy. And it's time to talk about computers and the Internet, cell phones and camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, and all that jazz, as we do every weekend. My phone number, 8888-ASK-LEO. That's 888-827-5536. Toll free anywhere in the U.S. Outside the U.S., use Skype, dial plus one, 888-827-5536, and you can join us and uh, talk about uh, tech. Of course, I'm just back from the Consumer Electronics Show. You might not know it, because normally, just back from the Consumer Electronics Show, I'd be talking like this, and I'd be coughing. I don't know how I did it, but somehow I avoided losing my uh, voice. They call it desert throat, and it really is. A, it's so dry in Las Vegas. We're, so what is Consumer Electronics Show? It's a big trade show, probably the biggest in the U.S., certainly the biggest technology show. I don't know about other industries. You know, there are other big shows, SEMA Tech for the auto industry and so forth, the Detroit Auto Show. But uh, but for, for us geeks, it's nerd stock. It is, uh, it is the show of the year in the U.S. It's, it's every January in Las Vegas. It's the only town in America that's big enough to hold it. And it, even, even Las Vegas is stretching at the seams when you get CES there. Around 150,000 attendees. 6,000 of them accredited press, so there's a big press corps from all over the world covering it. Uh, 20, well, let's see, 3,100 exhibitors, 3,100 exhibitors from all over the world. In fact, if you look through the exhibitor list, there are several dozen that begin with the word Shenzhen, which is the uh, town in China near Peking, near Beijing. Uh, that I'm showing my age near Peking, near Beijing, that uh, is an industrial zone, and a lot of companies come out of there, and they apparently like to have the name Shenzhen in the title of the company. Tons of companies from China, from Asia, from all over the world, and all of them are there for really two reasons. One, the original reason of the Consumer Electronics Show, which is to reach dealers. These folks manufacture stuff that are that's sold in stores. The stores come to decide how much of this stuff they want to sell in 2012. A lot of the stuff isn't even available yet. Most of it isn't even available yet. It's all new for the most part. And uh, some of it won't be available till later this year. Some of it not even till uh, next year. I remember uh, Ford showing last year the 2012 Electric Focus it's just now, just now can you get on the waiting list, more than a year later. So that's pretty common. Some of the stuff that you see, and I want you to take everything that we talk about, all the products we talk about today, or that you've seen perhaps reported about from CES, some with a grain of salt, because some of that stuff is never coming out. Some of that stuff is there, they just want to show dealers to see what they think. And if nobody, <laughs> nobody says, yeah, we'll order a thousand of those, then they just don't make it. So it's, it, you have to, when you go to CES, it takes a, a seasoned hand. You can always tell people who are new to CES because they get so excited about stuff. <laughs> it takes a seasoned hand to know really, well, is that real or is that just a prototype concept? It's like the Detroit Auto Show. You see this in coverage of the Auto Show, which happened, by the way, this week also. 
uh, you see all these pictures of cool looking cars, you know, gull wings and weird shapes. And uh, they say concept car, maybe. But what they don't say is this will not ever be manufactured. This is not in any way intended to be a representation of anything this company will ever, ever, ever make. It's just a pretty picture. They don't say that because if they did, you might go, well, okay, who cares? <laughs> then they want you to care. So I'm going to, I will, I know from long experience, long and bitter experience with the Consumer Electronics Show, what is good and what isn't, what's real, what's not. And I'll try to give you some perspective on all of that. The other thing that happens when you're a press at CES is, uh, you know, part of your job is to, is to develop a story, a narrative around the show. It's big, 3,100 exhibits. You need to somehow, somehow come up with a tagline, and a sentence, or maybe two, but an elevator pitch for what CES was this year. And so I spent, and I know my colleagues do, uh, much of that week, Monday through Friday, trying to figure out what's going on. What does it all mean? Because you just don't, I mean, you, I could give you a list of, of 3,000 new products, but what does it all mean? So I'll talk about uh, what I think the trends were at CES. I'll also, this today, I'll also talk about uh, some of the products I think that are important, because there are some important products this year. Uh, during this show. Coming up also, uh, I have to say, I'm very excited about this. Steve Gibson, this is important, our security guru. He doesn't join us all the time, but from time to time he stops by with important security news. Turns out there is a really important uh, news item about wireless routers and their security. And, uh, you know, I've always said it's very simple to secure a wireless router, to make a wireless, a Wi-Fi router as secure as a wired router. We all have these nowadays. You, you have Wi-Fi. You have a router. Uh, just by turning on something called WPA encryption. Well, it turns out there is a recently discovered a flaw in the way many of the most modern Wi-Fi routers work that will get around that security. So Steve will explain that all to us at 33 after the hour. Stay tuned for that. It's very important if you have a Wi-Fi router to know what to do about that. So what is this? So, but I'm going to start by talking about the single most important thing we saw at CES. How about that? If you if you only come away with with one news story from the Consumer Electronics Show, what would it be? And uh, in in my opinion, it is these. And I know Scott Wilkinson will concur. We'll talk to him tomorrow. He'll give us his CES wrap up. He's our home theater guy. In fact, he's the one who convinced me of this. It's going to be these new OLED TVs. We knew they'd be there. LG and uh, Samsung announced ahead of time, we're going to be showing 55-inch displays. That's a, you know, nice size HDTV displays based not on LCD or LED backlit LCD or plasma, not on anything we've seen before, but on organic light-emitting diodes. Now, you probably have seen those before. Many of the newer phones like the Samsung Galaxy S2 or the Galaxy Nexus, many of the Samsung phones have OLED displays. And if you've ever seen one, you know why it's exciting, because they're, they're just beautiful. But, we, but nobody's been able to make them big enough to put in an HDTV. The biggest we've seen that's ever been for sale is an 11-inch display from Sony, which cost $2,500, and which, by the way, Sony discontinued. <laughs> so <laughs> I was thinking, well, maybe OLED is dead. It's been a long time since we've seen a new display technology. It's been plasma and LCD for a long time. The biggest uh, advance was backlighting LCDs with LEDs. That was the, that's the biggest thing we've seen in, in 10 years. We've talked about technologies like SED that never took off. Well, OLED is here. And more importantly, these weren't concept sets. Well, they were. But both companies, Samsung and LG, said, nope, we're going to be selling these in 2012, probably in the fall. They would not say how much. And I've heard speculation ranging from five to eight thousand dollars for a fifty-five inch. Yeah, that's really expensive. But I have to point out the first plasma HDTVs were much more expensive. Fifteen thousand dollars for a fifty-inch display. Fifteen thousand dollars for a fifty-inch display. The prices will drop as soon as they get economy of scale. As soon as some of the richer people among us buy those. OLED displays, the rest of us can start affording them because I think by this time or uh, by fall of 2013, 
OLED displays will be the dominant display. They will be equal in the, maybe not, maybe not as big as LCD, but I would say equal to plasma. And here's why. They're different. They're a different kind of technology. Organic light emitting diode displays, OLED displays. Oh, I'll tell you what. I t I'll tell you why after the break. How about that? Because I hear the magic sound saying, "Leo, shut up." Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. We'll talk about CES and answer your calls next. <laughs> hey, you know what I love? I want to talk about it briefly before we get back to the show. One of our sponsors. You know, this is great too. This is something we just started doing uh, at the beginning of the year. And it's been a great success. Uh, we, we've started selling ads on the podcasts because uh, up to now, we haven't been able to monetize the podcasts. And it's important. You know, I, you know we could go the Louis C.K. model and, uh, and uh, charge you. But I, but I like doing free stuff. Wait a minute. <laughs> it's empty. <laughs> no, it's all right. Yeah, well, if you got the meter line around. <laughs> I want to, <laughs> but uh, advertise. We like to do a free advertising supported media. One of the reasons is I don't have to worry about piracy then, um, because the ads are baked right in. And you know, if you pirate the show, fine. In fact, there's no such thing as piracy on free media. Just please distribute it all you want. Um, but anyway, the uh, one of the advertisers that uh, has been I've been a fan of for ten years, and uh, they've been fans of ours, and they've been very supportive of everything we've ever done. Is a company called Stamps.com. And I, and I just want to take some time to let you know what they do. Because I don't know how, how many people know about Stamps.com. I think more should. Stamps.com basically turns your desk into your post office. Mac or PC, you go to Stamps.com. I'm going to give you a, a no-risk trial in a second. But you go to Stamps.com. You can print all the postage you need, whether it's for a postcard, a letter, a package, Right from your computer, they, uh, there's a digital scale that they give you for free. You put it on there so you always have exactly the right postage. And you never have to go to the post office ever because you just, the, the mailman will pick it up, the mail carrier will pick it up, or you can even schedule a pickup. The post office loves it. They don't want you to go into the post office, and stamps.com enables that in such a nice way. You print exactly the postage you want. If you're an eBay seller or a you know Amazon seller, if you sell online, this is great. If, for instance, you're mailing internationally, the software fills out all the forms, prints them out for you. Uh, if you're doing priority mail, you get discounts you can't get at the post office. It's just a fantastic deal. Yes, you pay a monthly fee, but you will save more money in just not going to the post office and in discounts. It more than pays for itself. So here's the deal. Uh, you, know, you get 21% off express mail and 15% off priority mail. You can't get that at the post office. Here's the deal. Use the promo code TECHGUY at stamps.com. You'll get this no-risk trial. It's a $110 bonus offer. You get the digital scale, the USB scale, $55 free postage. They wanted, they're they going to set you up with $55 free postage. So what you do is you go to stamps.com. Before you do anything else, and this is Mac or PC. For a long time, it was only PC. They got Mac software now. I love that. Before you do anything else, you click that uh, Get Started. Let's see. Oh, by the way, notice it's an $80 deal on, on the website. We got a better deal. So don't click the $80. Click the microphone. Say, heard about it on the radio. And enter the offer code Tech Guy. Then you get the $110 deal, including $55 free postage. Oh, there's my head. <laughs> if you don't see my smiling face, you're on the wrong, <laughs> on the wrong offer. See, it went up from $80 to $110. You get the supplies kit, the four-week trial, the $55 in postage, and the digital scale free when you use Tech Guy. Please try it. Just do yourself a favor. Try it. Anybody in the chat room use stamps.com? It's fantastic. The Postal Service does not want to be in the Postal Service business. You know that. They're closing post offices. They're cutting off a Saturday mail. you got to try it. Stamps.com. We thank them for their support of uh, all of our efforts on the Tech Guy. Doctor Who theme. Doctor Who, me, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That's who. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the number we're taking your calls, talking about tech. I'm excited about these OLED displays. If you saw them, you would know why. 
They are gorgeous. I saw both the Samsung and the LG. Uh, and a display that Sony did not call OLED, but it was clearly OLED. The OLED is different than an, uh, than an LCD. An LCD uh, flat panel has a backlight, either fluorescent or, in these more modern uh, TVs, LED backlights that shine through a shutter. That's the liquid crystal. And filters to give it the color that it needs. And uh, so it's a backlit, just like your laptop, it's a backlit display where light is shining through crystals that are opening and closing to give you the, the motion, the video. It's a very cool technology, liquid crystal. Uh, OLED is much more like the old-fashioned tube television. Plasma works a little differently. Plasma has glowing pixels. They're electrified to glow, <laughs> in effect. Um, plasma is more like a CRT. But OLED is interesting. It is emissive which means that you're looking at the light directly created by those LEDs. You're looking at LEDs. Uh, and because you're looking at LEDs and there's not a, black, a backlight that's always on, you get darker blacks. A liquid crystal display, that shutter closes, it's supposed to be black, but the backlight is still there, and so it isn't a black black. It's not a dark of night black. It's kind of a gray black. They're getting better at it, but it's still not perfect. OLED like plasma, like CRTs, when those pixels are off, they're off. It's dark. There's nothing there. There's no light. The whites are white, bright. The only net negative, and I, this will be interesting to see how they handle this, of OLED displays, and you know this if you have an OLED or a Super AMOLED display on your phone, on your uh, Samsung or similar phone, is that the colors are really kind of uh, bright, almost too bright, almost... Uh, you know, obnoxiously so. So that's uh, that's the issue. On that is is how are they? Is it is it too good of a display? Is it too bright? Is it un unnaturally bright display? And I have to say, the OLEDs that we saw at um, CES were very very brilliant in their color. I think that it's the kind of brilliance that appeals to people. I'm sure that they will have color profiles on these displays, as they do on displays they sell today, that are less um, vivid. Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guy, asked the LG and Samsung uh, people, do you have the, the TVs set to vivid, the kind of setting that they use in the stores to attract people? Yes, we have it set on its brightest, most, you know, <laughs> most uh, candy color uh, displays. So... Presumably, they'll have a movie setting or, a, you know, a darker setting that is more true to life. But these displays are capable of brilliant, brilliant color. Beautiful, rich, dark blacks. Gorgeous whites. They're fast. The response time is like a CRT, effectively zero. That's important for motion. They're gorgeous. And they will be here this fall. They'll be expe expensive initially. But they will be here this fall, and when they come out, I think they will be very much in demand, which will drop the price, and I have a feeling your next TV may be an OLED display. That's unusual for something that's shown as a prototype as CES, but I think this is more than a prototype. So to me, that was the most important product at the Consumer Electronics Show this week. I'll talk about some of the other trends, and I'll give you my narrative. Uh, yes, I do have a story <laughs> at CES, but let's get some phone calls in. Uh, starting with Turlock, California, uh, Davis is on the line. Hi, Davis. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, hey, Leo. It's great talking to you. I had a, um, I have this iMac, uh, and I have um, I had it stuff open up in different accounts, you know, the user accounts that you can create. Mm -hmm. I had too many windows open, I think. And I was, uh, for some reason, I got started using into a guest account, right? You know, the, the guest account you can create where everything gets deleted if, when you restart, right? When you log out. And so I think I had too many windows open and it couldn't wake up from energy saver mode. And so I tried everything I could to, uh, you know, I was... You can't have too many windows open on a Mac, so that's not what caused oh. whatever happened. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I, I was, you know, it was starting to run slow and everything. Maybe I had it on too long or something. But anyway, I had too many accounts. Uh, maybe I had too many accounts open. Are you, are you running Lion? Are you running the latest version of OS X Lion? Um, uh, I'm running, let's see, about this Mac. Let's see. It's uh, version 10.5.8. 
Well, that's a, that's not lion, obviously. That's uh, yeah. God. I can't. Let's see. That's snow leopard, leopard, panther. That's an old version. Yeah, this Mac leopard. is about I don't know, three, five years old, I guess. Yeah. Um, I. It's leopard. Okay. Uh. So what is the problem that you can't get into your system? Well, yeah. Well, I. What happened was, okay, so the energy saver, it wouldn't kick back up, you know, it wouldn't wake things up, but the lights came on on the USB devices, right? And so I tried unplugging them, plugging them back in, wouldn't wake it up, you know, clicking the mouse, clicking the keyboard, nothing would wake the thing up. And, you know, I, find, I waited a day, I was hoping that if it went back into permanent, if it went back into energy saver, like a full energy, if it went back to sleep. No, this I is not, none of this is, I, I, I like your theory, but none of this is what happened. <laughs> I presume you have rebooted the machine, and by that I mean turn it off all the way. You know, sometimes this does happen with Macs, um, particularly with laptops. They won't come on, or they or they're, they're, the screen won't come on, even though they're on, or you can't see it. So what I would do is, you know, if you press and hold, they don't... <laughs> Steve Jobs, it's interesting, in the interview that he gave Walter Isaacson for the biography, he said uh, he didn't like on-off switches, because it reminded him of death. <laughs> it was a philosophical thing. And so it's true that on Apple products, they don't have on-off switches as many other products do. So in order to turn it off, you have to go through some jumping through some hoops. In this case, and actually it's in most cases, if you press and hold the on switch for long enough, it'll turn it off. So uh, that's what I would do. Make sure you've really turned it off and then turn it on again. If it's a pretty old machine, the chat room is saying command option PR to zap the parameter RAM. That is a real old fix. Um, parameter RAM on a Mac is the same as the, uh, as the CMOS settings on a, a PC. It's a place where settings about the hardware are stored. Mm, yeah, I guess you could try that. Command, Option, P, and R. It takes four fingers. Hold all. So what you want to do is you want to shut down the Mac entirely, either through the command line, which you, or rather the menu, which you can't get to, or just by holding the button long enough. Now, only do this, by the way, if your Mac is really unresponsive. It's always best with any computer to shut it down normally. Turning it off this way, a preemptory shutdown, is kind of dangerous if the machine's writing to the hard drive, if it's doing anything at all. If it's frozen, it's not. So don't, you know, just be careful. Don't do it, you know, like the first thing goes wrong. Oh, I'm going to turn it off. No. Wait a while. Make sure it's not writing to the drives or anything like that. Then uh, press and hold the on-off switch. Command, Option, P, and R, four fingers. Let it beep a couple of times and then boot up. See if that helps. Often that does. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo, let's welcome my security guru to the stage here. Mr. Steve Gibson of GRC.com. Uh, Steve hosts a podcast uh, with me on a regular uh, basis every week called Security Now. And he joins us every once in a while when there's a big security story. You have to be a pretty hardcore security nerd to listen to Security Now. It's for, it's for people who really care about how computers work, how security works. Although I do recommend it if you're interested. Steve is also the creator of a great piece of software that you hear me recommend almost weekly called Spinrite. It's a hard drive maintenance and uh, recovery utility at grc.com. And I wanted him to join us this week because there is a hack about that concerns a lot of us, especially, especially uh, the less sophisticated computer users. Steve, welcome to the Tech Guy Show. Hey, Leah. Great to be with you this so, weekend. Explain to me, Steve, um, what is the hack? Okay, so... Um, this involves all wireless routers, which have been made in the last few years. It happens that mine are older, so I don't have the problem. So some listeners with older routers may not be exposed to this. But the so-called Wi-Fi Alliance, which is the group that organized the Wi-Fi standard and maintains it, they wanted to make routers that is wireless Wi-Fi, more secure and easier to use. So they created this idea of just using a pin, a, an eight-digit pin, like people use with their ATMs in order to verify who they are, which would be printed on the router. And 
setting up a secure connection would be as easy as just entering the router's PIN number, this eight-digit number, into your computer when you wanted to get your computer online with Wi-Fi. So the whole idea was to make it possible for people who weren't sophisticated to set up a Wi-Fi router securely. Exactly. Easily. Instead of having to, instead of having to use a super long, impossible-to-remember passphrase, which has been the traditional way of making Wi-Fi secure, is to use something that nobody can guess. The idea would be just to use this simple eight-digit PIN. So what happened was a security researcher discovered a defect in the way this has been implemented by all Wi-Fi routers because they were following the specification, which is itself at fault, which allows bad guys over the course of a few hours, which is the big, the, the, the big concern, it doesn't take long to do this, to break into our wireless routers, which we have up until now believed were secure. So the bad guy would have to be uh, within range of your Wi-Fi router. He'd have to be sitting on your curb or your neighbor if you're in an apartment. He'd have to be near enough to be able to actually see your Wi-Fi router. Right. Many of us, when we are wanting to log into our own Wi-Fi network, our, our computer will pop up a list of all the networks with their, which are within range, and we'll see lots of these other networks. Well, those would be targets for this kind of exploit. So, so you, I think the biggest risk here is that your neighbor is sophisticated enough. And you don't have to be sophisticated to do the attack because you can download it. It's easy. But sophisticated enough to know that it exists. And then he'd be able to use your router, even though you have it password protected, uh, to, to get on the Internet. Well, and more importantly, maybe, to get on your network. Right. Once upon a time, the interest was just in borrowing someone else's bandwidth and using their router to get on the Internet. <clears throat> now there's also a concern that they could be poking around in your computers, right. which you certainly don't want. The, the sad thing is this is on many new routers from the biggest companies like Linksys, D-Link, uh, you know, if you have a button on your router that you press to set up your router, you have it. Or if your router on the back label where it has the serial number and typically the, the so-called MAC address, it, all, it may also say router pin with an eight-digit number. That would be your cue that your router has what's called WPS, Wi-Fi Protected Security, which turns out to be not as secure as we were hoping. So what do you do <laughs> if, you, if you do have a, a router? That, and most again, most routers sold in the last couple of years do have this. What do you do to, 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 to secure yourself? Well, the good news is that, that generally this can be disabled if you log into your router itself and get to your router. You, norm, you normally use a, a web browser and you put in yeah. in the URL something like 192.168.1.1 or .0. Unfortunately, the reason they put this WPS on there is so that people who don't know what the hell you're talking about can, can set up their router securely. So it turns out that really to be secure, once again, you have to be able to you know, manage your router by logging into it with a browser. This will right. be described in your in your manual, or you can, if you don't have the manual, go online to the browser's to the router's manufacturer, because you have to go in the browser and enter in a number, and it varies for every router. It usually begins with one nine eight dot one six two, but not always. Right, and so most routers allow this function, this WPS, although they also brand that by different names depending upon the manufacturer of the router. They want it, you know, like quick and easy configuration or something like that. So most routers can have this disabled. The, the, one of the big concerns here is that one of the most popular brands that the Linksys brand, which Cisco purchased, has the option, but it doesn't work. So you so can turn you, it off and it's still on? Yes. Okay, <laughs> so, so what, what do people yeah. do if they have a Linksys router? Uh, all they can really do is is wait for <laughs> you or me to tell them that there's new firmware, which even you know escalates the difficulty of fixing this because all the manufacturers are scampering around right now coming up with 
improvements to the firmware which will fix this problem but then users are going to have to update the firmware and their right. routers that's the that, that's the ultimate cure for this problem. So the good news, it is easy for the router manufacturers to fix, but in order for it to be fixed, you have to go into your, that setup again, that 192.168.1.1 1 .1 or whatever it is, and, and usually it's the advanced tab where it has an entry for update firmware. <laughs> you have to go through that process and, and, and download and install new software on the router for it to be fixed. And so far, has any router manufacturer, have they, has anybody announced a fix? No, no announcement yet. They're scurrying around. They've acknowledged the problem. And they're, it sounds like their PR firms are generating yeah. boilerplates. Like, well, we are very concerned about security and we're going to be addressing this as soon as we can. So it's like, oh, okay. So the only way to know is if you have either a WPS button or an auto config button on your router or there's a PIN number, an eight-digit PIN number on the back on a sticker uh, on your router. If you've got either of those, you do have WPS. You can try to disable it, but there are router manufacturers, including Linksys, which is the number one router, uh, who the disable doesn't fix it. It's still on. And right. what is the risk, again, if I, if I can't turn it off or I don't turn it off? Okay, so I would say at this point in time, it's probably minimal. The hackers are also scurrying around developing tools easy to use tools to make this well just because they want to they want to mess around with people's connections that's what hackers hack so i would say at this moment there's not a huge problem but it's going to grow over time steve gibson is at grc.com at sggrc on twitter leo laporte thank you steve leo laporte the tech guy i'll talk a little more about fixing this in just a bit we ran out of time but we got everything in yeah and uh, i mean the sad thing is there that people are saying, well, I could disable SSID. That's not going to do anything. No, and MAC address filtering doesn't work either. No. That'll be a Q&A on Security right. Now next. Yeah, people, right. people are jumping to these other things. Operating. Now, it will help if, you're, if it's just your neighbor who wants to borrow your Wi-Fi. If he can't see it, he doesn't have the tools probably to figure out your SSID. Uh, or to, and he probably doesn't know how to spoof your MAC address. But the Correct. problem is the real bad guy does. It's easy to and, do. And we can see automation coming to this pretty Yeah, it would be too. an easy thing, actually, to uh, yep. build that into the tool. Yep. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I appreciate tomorrow, it. Tomorrow, one thirty. Yeah, I think one thirty because um, uh, we have uh, uh, Scott Wilkinson and Chris Marquardt on the first two hours. So one thirty be good for us. And it probably picks up a different exactly. chunk of audience. Different also. people listening. Exactly. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. Talk really you appreciate you doing it. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Steve is so great. What a, with a cheetah fast what a mensch. And right now save 10 hey, we, were, we had so much fun at uh, CES um, with Ford, and I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about some of the things that we found out about you know Ford uh, while we were there, including their new electric vehicles. Ford, um, it's funny because the Detroit Auto Show goes at the same time as uh, as uh, the CES show this year. So I talked to Alan Mulally, the CEO of Ford. I said, <laughs> just like, when you saw the schedule, did you go crazy? He said, you know, it, uh, I, he, he says, I was in Delhi two days ago, India, opening a plant there. I was in Detroit today unveiling the 2013 Ford Fusion, and I'm here at CES now. We had dinner with him. I, had, I got to interview him, and I had dinner with him, and uh, I have to say, such an impressive guy, and he has really taken Ford into the 21st century in a big way. 30 years at Boeing, he really knows about technology, and he's turning Ford's automobiles into state-of-the-art technology vehicles to the point where they are the leaders in this. Over every other auto manufacturer everywhere in the world, nobody's doing more than Ford, to the point uh, electric vehicles. Now, yes, others have built electric vehicles and distributed them sooner than Ford. And I asked Alan about that. He said, well, we didn't want to just do one electric vehicle. We wanted to electrify our entire fleet. We wanted to create processes so that we could, on the assembly line, be building an automobile and have it have an EcoBoost gas engine, have a diesel engine, have a hybrid engine, have an electric engine, have a plug-in hybrid engine, depending on demand. And in order to do that, we had to retool everything. And that's what they're doing. So it's starting with a 2012 Focus, the electric Focus, which is out uh, any day now. You can get on the waiting list for that. Next year, the 2013 C-Max Energy. This is going to be a very interesting car. It's a plug-in hybrid. The Fusion will be plug-in hybrid uh, as well, uh, as well as all the other kinds, right? So 
as demand is, you know, because if you're in Iowa and you've got, you know, everything is 100 miles apart, an electric vehicle is not going to work for you. But a plug-in hybrid will work for you or, you know, so it depends on what you need. And the point that Ford wanted to make is, look, we're a global company making automobiles for every market in the world. The needs are different. We want to have a system that makes it possible to do what's needed in any market on demand. I think this is just, this is, this is how an engineer thinks, right? Let's get the right solution. Uh, the, of course, they're using state-of-the-art stuff, regenerative braking. So as you step on the brake, all of that kinetic energy that's normally lost in heat gets pumped right back into the battery. I think that's so cool. Um, this the sink that they have in my Ford Touch now does all sorts of stuff to maximize your range. Your smartphone app can access your vehicle status, state of charge, current range. You can even program the charge settings. You know, you're plugged in in the garage, you're in the living room. You use smart use your smartphone to to download vehicle data to pl program your settings. It's just amazing. Uh, value charging powered by Microsoft allows Ford customers to reduce electricity costs by taking advantage of off peak hours. Charging three to four hours with a 240-volt home charging station. I'll go on and tell you more in a bit, but let's get back to work here. Carbonite consumers are live. Thank you. Centuries, but that was then, not now. Spent too much time playing wild. <laughs> well, there was a time we sat on IRC making jokes on how... Where do you find this geek stuff? No Kyle Benham, my musical director, somehow manages to find the strangest songs. The day the Rooters died. The routers, sometimes they call them. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Yeah, Kyle makes a, a playlist out of all the songs he plays and um, puts them on his Google Plus account. Uh, he's Kyle Benham, B-E-N-H-A-M. We also put it in the show notes at the uh, end of the show. James DeRuvo will do that. Show notes are at techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com. And that's where I put links. Eric James puts links to everything I talk about. We will have a link to uh, some of the information, some more of the geeky information about this router security flaw. This is a big one. And it's really hitting, it's hitting people who are least able to uh, take care of themselves. The whole purpose of WPS was to make it easy to lock down your router. Turning off WPS is the only way to fix it. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't even work on the biggest brand name routers. If you're a geek and you're listening and you have friends and family who use Wi-Fi, and I'm sure you do, I'm sure all of them do, help them out, would you? Um, you know, go over to their house, turn off WPS, if it's, there's nothing to say about it if uh, you're using a Linksys router. You just have to wait till Linksys updates their firmware. That'll happen soon, I hope. Turns out it's a very easy fix for them to implement. The technical fix is very simple. Uh, but they have to do it, and uh, they have to change the firmware to do it. Uh, if your router settings, as a pool guy says in our chat room, have a a checkbox says router pin disabled. That will do it. Unless it's a Linksys. Doesn't matter if this is the weird thing about Linksys. It's so buggy that even if you disable this feature, it's still enabled. And the reason it's uh, scary is because Lifehack, I'm, this kind of annoys me. Lifehacker, which is normally a, a blog that, you know, has some responsibility, published an article on how to hack routers with this trick, and there's a software program out there called Reaver that people can download and use for free that's easy. So they, they, they gave people step-by-step -step instructions. So unfortunately, I mean, it would have happened anyway, but this just kind of sped up the process. So unfortunately, kids, people who are not technical, uh, can figure out how to do this. Your neighbor can figure out how to get on your Wi-Fi access spot, you know, that's negative because maybe he's borrowing, you know, some of your bandwidth, but it could be worse if he's doing illegal stuff on there. You could be held liable. We've seen that happen before. So, you know, all in all, um, this is a mess. And I just wanted you to know about it. I don't want you to be terrified, but I think it's worth uh, checking to see if your router has this WPS feature. And if it does, uh, to disable it if you can. And if you can't, don't live in fear. Just uh, keep listening. Dave in St. Louis, Missouri. Hi, Dave. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo, great to talk with you. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for calling. Yeah, uh, so I'm in the market for an Android 
10 inch Wi-Fi tablet, looking mm-hmm. at 16 gigabytes. Um, you know, there's a wide array of Android tablets, right? So trying to narrow it down, I'm kind of leaning towards one that doesn't have a lot of bloatware or is locked down like a Kindle Fire or something like that. Uh, I want to at least be able to see if it'll be upgradable. You know, you want you want one uh, ideally that will allow you to go to ice cream sandwich because um, the honeycomb, or even worse, the uh, gingerbread operating systems versions of Android that are available on most tablets are not great. Uh, ice cream sandwich is designed for a tablet. It's the first really good uh, operating system from Google for uh, for tablets. Well, I shouldn't say really good. It's it's still not quite iPad good, but it's the best that's out there. Um, we saw a lot of Android tablets at CES. They're all very similar. I like the Samsung Galaxies. Um, yeah, they have I a that on my list. yeah seven seven is just out. They have a seven inch. They have a ten inch. Um, the only negative on the Galaxy at all is it uses a non-standard connector for charging. So I mean I'm not crazy about that because if you lose it, you got to get another one. Right. Uh, I would uh, one that comes with ice cream sandwich is a little bit more expensive, but has a little bit more capability. Is the Asus Transformer Prime? Is that on oh, your list? Oh yeah, I had the Asus E Pad on my list too. So yeah, because I like the whole idea of hooking up a keyboard and trying to see if it could be. That's like what the Transformer it. does, and I think if if you now it's more a little more expensive because of this keyboard solution, but if you're willing to uh, spend a little extra money. Uh, this is absolutely the way to go. It's a beautiful tablet, uh, has very high speed capabilities. It comes with ice cream sandwich, which you do want, ultimately. Most of them will be upgraded, but you do want. Good battery life, very good battery life when you attach the keyboard, because the keyboard has additional battery in it. A very nice 8 megapixel camera, which, uh, you know, that beats the iPad all, all, all over the place. Has an SD card reader, a micro HDMI port. Um, so there's a lot of capabilities that don't exist on the iPad. If you really want the best tablet out there, get the um, get the Transformer Prime. You don't have to get the keyboard. You can get that later. I think it starts right. at four hundred something. What they, they said the E-Pad had a lot of choppy video on it. Would they have been able to solve that? Is it, is I haven't seen. You know, I haven't seen that. Uh, you know, choppy video is. Probably Flash. Flash is really not ideal on these devices, even though it's gotcha. that's a selling point for uh, Android tablets is it does support Flash, unlike the iPad. But, you know, even even Adobe says we're not going to make Flash for these devices anymore. It's just too hard. The, the Transformer Prime has a Tegra on it, which is a very fast quad-core processor from NVIDIA. It has NVIDIA uh, graphics. I think that the Prime is not going to have any trouble playing back video any more than any PC would. If video is choppy on your PC, well, it'll be choppy on your tablet. But the, boy, you can't get a more powerful tablet than the, than this Prime. So if that's a concern for you, this is what I would go with the. It's the Asus EPad Transformer Prime TF201. If you must. Very know. good. I wrote it all down. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Dave. Uh, I I am still thinking that the iPad uh, is still the king. Just because of, you know, beautiful interface and choice of apps. But when it comes to hardware, there's no question that they, 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 Apple has been eclipsed by products like this with quad-core. Bigger screens, wide, you know, they're 16.9, so they're better for movies. Um, they have lots of additional features like SD card slots, uh, HDMI slots, more battery life. I think in many respects from, from a, you know, in the ways that companies can beat Apple because they can come out with this stuff more often. I mean, in the time since the iPad 2's come out, Asus has released two different Transformers. The nice thing is you can, you could turn this into a laptop as long as you're willing to pay almost laptop prices. Um, this, is, this is a beautiful looking tablet. It would be a fine laptop with the addition of the keyboard dock. Um, and I think as a tablet, it's, it's really state-of-the-art. But we saw a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of tablets. There are a lot of Android tablets out there. Um, and, and they're all going to come on strong. Now, we're starting to hear rumors finally about the iPad 3. I'll tell you a little bit about what we expect with the iPad 3. It, they, apparently, they've ramped up manufacture, which means we should see it soon. Details to come. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. And it's time to talk computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, and all that jazz. Uh, a show dedicated to the stuff, the toys in your life. Although, 
Truthfully, I don't think they're toys. I think they're magical devices that can change the world in the right hands. And that's why I like to talk about it, because I think in your hands, these technologies can make your life better, can make the world better, as long as you understand how to use them. And, of course, there's, uh, there's uh, some point to saying you also have to use them defensively because everybody else is using them. So it's important to know this stuff and how it works. Uh, well, we just got back from the Consumer Electronics Show. I had my uh, almost everybody on my staff. About 15 people were out there. We covered the show wall-to-wall, -wall, end to end up and down uh, on our Twit network. In fact, we've got specials produced from each day of the uh, big Consumer Electronics Show available at twit.tv. Uh, slash specials, or you could go to YouTube and see them there, youtube.com slash twit. Uh, really a, a fascinating show. And there are a couple of trends that came through. I mentioned last hour, I think those OLED TVs that Samsung and LG showed are significant. Uh, I talked to my friend Robert Heron, who's a home theater expert, and he said, the Samsung is the one to look at because it uses true RGB pixels. The LG is using a technology called subpixel rendering with a white pixel and filters. It's not as good. And I have to say, I agree with him. I like a full RGB, and that's what you get from the Samsung. So that's going to be the TV to watch. The other trend, huge, headphones, headphones, headphones everywhere. And I think that's because so many people have iPods and iPhones and other players, and they all get these cheesy earbuds They fall out. They're uncomfortable, and they don't give you great audio. So I think people are looking for something more. The kids are looking for style. That's why rap stars like Dr. Dre with his beats and Ludacris had headphones and F even 50 Cent had headphones there. Those are the style and headphones. And then there were a lot of headphone companies with uh, high-end technologies like Shure at Emotix that had, you know, audiophile headphones there. This is the, this was, I tell you, I never saw so many headphones in my life. Able Planet, so uh, I, I think that the, that was one of the trends that I didn't expect, but it was absolutely uh, v visible at the show. One of the things I got to do, there were a lot of cars, too. All the major car manufacturers are treating their cars as consumer electronics devices, and no one more so than our sponsor. And I have to tell you that this is our sponsor uh, for the uh, coverage that we did at uh, CES was Ford. But I have been a, I drive a Ford, I drive a 2010 Mustang, and I've been a Ford fan for some time. And I've been very impressed by their attention to uh, safety in the cockpit and in electronics in the cockpit. I got a chance, and I was very grateful for it, to talk to the CEO of Ford, Alan Mulally, who I think is one of the top business leaders in this country. Brilliant guy. And I don't say that because he's advertising with me. but I say it because I have the utmost respect for this guy. First thing I asked him, I said, Alan, you know that the Detroit Auto Show is going on right now, too, right? What are you doing here? This is what he had to say. It is. And I, I, just, uh, I just flew here from, uh, well, from Delhi to the International Auto Show. Oh then we God. just launched the Fusion, the Fusion petrol version with EcoBoost, also the Fusion hybrid, and also the plug-in hybrid with Sync and MyFord and MyFord applications so that you could have an ecosystem to deal and live with your electric vehicle. I, when you saw the schedule for CES, you must have said, oh, no, it's the same, it's the same week as the uh, auto show. But I wouldn't miss CES, and I wouldn't miss you, because well, this is a fantastic development. I think it's telling because uh, it shows that you consider Ford as much a consumer electronics company as a car company. Absolutely. You remember when we talked the last time, and I think you might have said it, it said, Ford, the mobile app of choice. Right. Because that's exactly what we expect of our car. We want an integrated life, hands on the wheel, eyes on the road, seamlessly connected to the internet with our smart devices. So you were in Delhi, India? Yes, we just launched the Echo Sport, and it's the first uh, subcompact SUV that's on a B-size platform, so a little bit smaller than the Fusion, and it's right in the center of the uh, Indian market. The people are so excited to get it. You, you, when, I remember we talked two years ago. You talked about making this an international platform, and you've done that now. It's, it's now in this what we call a CD4 platform. We'll make ten different top hats after it, over it. Four, That's the styling on top. On the outside. So we'll have sedans, we'll have SUVs, we'll have wagons, we'll have sport utility vehicles, all off the same platform, which means that we can offer these vehicles more affordably than anybody else so that everybody can afford them. And you make the same, the same car line for all the different uh, powertrains. Well, now, this is a really important point because we make the petrol version, the diesel, 
the hybrid, the plug-in hybrid, and the all-electric, all in the same production line. 70% of the parts are the same, so that means we can offer all that value, all that affordability to the consumer. You manufacture all over the world? Absolutely. Same vehicle, same bill of material. Uh, and also, but the neat thing is, is, is that with the software and the connectivity, all of that is interchangeable around the world too, but also providing all the different languages. Last time we talked, I asked about autonomous vehicles. You said people love to drive. They're never going to want a car that drives itself. But you're putting more and more technology that these cars practically drive themselves with Bliss, with the auto park. Well, the neat, the, the neat thing is, though, that with uh, GPS and Wi-Fi, that now we know, the cars know where each other are. Right. So I think the next really revolution is going to be helping people not run into each other. Right. That's it, it, it's sneaking autonomous vehicles in there. But I think it's a, it's great. I still have my hands on the wheel, but I'm not going to get as likely to get in a collision because it knows where the vehicles are around Absolutely. me. And the safety features now. You know everything we're doing about roll and stability control and yaw stability control, the blind spot monitoring, the cross traffic alert when you back out of the parking lot. I mean, today with electronics and digital technology and miniaturization. And the consumer electronics marrying with the automobile, you're actually we're actually helping people be better drivers as well as have more safety. I got to ask you about distracted driving. You know, Mercedes announced today that they're going to put Facebook in their vehicles, and I just had the worst image of people, you know, checking in on Facebook. People want to be connected. I know your customers are pushing you that way, but we just saw the NTSB say that any phone conversation at all is dangerous. How do you balance the two? Well, we absolutely agree. We were one of the first companies that came out and said that we absolutely didn't want to see texting in cars because what all of our data says that if you have your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road, your ability your cognitive ability to manage other things is fantastic, but you need to keep your eyes on the road. So that's why we have gone with voice activation. I hate the idea of looking down at the GPS. That's dangerous. Absolutely. So hands on the wheel, eyes on the road, all voice activation, but using your smart device. And I think that we're actually reducing distraction and making it safer. Can I ask you one tough question? Yes, sir. And it's because, uh, you know, you, you're a big supporter of our, our network. Ford has been fantastic as an advertiser. And one of the things our audience keeps asking us, I hear Ford supports SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act. Now, I know that you never came out in favor of SOPA, but do you want to clarify that? I'm not so familiar with with that. This is this is the there's a Senate uh, law called PIPA and a, and a House law called SOPA about online piracy. And I know you've spoken out before, saying intellectual property rights are important to protect. If somebody invents something, they need to be protected. But I, you know, when Scott Monty has said this, Ford never said we support SOPA. You're not on the list of SOPA supporters. But word got out that you were, and of course, among our geek community, that's. Anathema. That's the kiss yeah. of death. Uh, Scott Monty absolutely is a famous leader. And if that's what he said, that's the way we. <laughs> All right. That's what I like. A man who supports his team. Absolutely. Alan, it's so great to see you. You're doing such a great job. We really appreciate it. What I love is the you're CEO of Ford, Alan Mulally. He really is a great guy. And uh, I was really glad we had a chance to uh, sit down and spend some time with him. Had dinner with him later that night and talked more about distracted driving. It is a big issue. Walt Mossberg of the Journal brought this up. He said there's, there's, there, are, there are movements across the country, a grassroots movements across the country, people who say we just don't want people texting. We don't want people uh, online while they're driving. And I couldn't agree more. And I think Ford's attitude towards this is exactly right, which is uh, you can do stuff, but you got to keep your eye on the road and your hands on the wheel. No fiddling with this stuff. It scares, it scares me to death to see what some of these other companies are doing, like Facebook in the car. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number, 888-827-5536. We'll get back to the phones, talk more in just a bit, more from CES2. Leo Laporte here, I am the Tech Guy. It's fun to hear those once in a while. <laughs> the oldies but goodies. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. 8888-ASK-LEO is the number. Our chat room is online and... Uh, on fire, on fuego, in fuego, 994 people in there. You can join them. Simple enough. Just go to techguylabs.com. That's our website. And uh, you can uh, check it out. Join the chat room. Well moderated, I have to say, thanks to all our great moderators. There's more than a dozen people in there keeping an eye on things. 8888-ASK. Leo's the phone number. Techguylabs.com is the website. Chat is a link away. If you want to join us in the uh, chat room, and I, I pay a lot of attention to the chat room because usually they know better than I do. <laughs> There's enough people in there that any question that comes in can be answered. We kind of got them on fire, though, uh, uh, po politically. This is going to be a very interesting political season. Talking about this SOPA and PIPA, 
January 18th, Wednesday, will be an Internet blackout day. If you go to Wikipedia on Wednesday and there's nothing there, don't be scared. Don't be surprised. Understand it's a protest against these two bills. I asked uh, Alan Mulally about them. In Congress, we've talked about them before, that are designed to break the Internet in order to protect the music industry, the motion picture industry, and other companies against piracy. They can't stop piracy, so they said, let's break the Internet. Maybe that'll help. They've tried to break computers for the same reason. They really, these companies, instead of m fixing their business model, which is completely doable, and many have done so already and are making plenty of money off the Internet despite piracy, these companies think uh, that the best way to handle this is, well, we're not going to change our business model. Let's change the Internet. Let's break the Internet because that's easier than thinking uh, about what we do and refiguring it. Piracy happens. Look, it's not a good thing. I'm not in favor of piracy. I guess my point is you can break the Internet. Piracy will still happen. Pippa and Sopa don't stop piracy. All they do is they mess things up for everybody else. And it's because we have an ignorant Congress that doesn't understand technology that these laws are even being considered. Uh, 83 engineers, the fathers and mothers of the Internet, including Paul Vixie, who developed the DNS system, Vince Cerf, who invented TCPIP, have written letters to Congress saying, we're dead set against this. These would be very, very bad ideas, and they would not stop piracy, and still Congress isn't listening. So watch, because Wednesday there's going to be a blackout, Internet-wide blackout of some of the biggest sites including Wikipedia, and I can has cheeseburger <laughs> because they want to bring attention to these SOPA and PIPA acts. Let's get back to the phones. Dave's on the line from Riverside. Hi, Dave. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, this is Dave. It's you. You're on. Welcome. Yeah. I was just checking to see that. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> They're really bad. Hey, I'm having an issue with my computer in the fact that I'll it will, after running for a number of days and working just fine, it'll shut itself off or I won't be able to wake it up and I have to do a hard shutdown. And then when I try and turn it back on, I get a power light for about five, maybe ten seconds, and then it just goes out. And I end up unplugging the system, plugging it back in. Sometimes it'll start. Then I take it down to my tech guy. We plug it in at his shop and it works just fine. I've done that. About yeah, I hate times. that. Isn't that awful? The, these problems <laughs> yeah, the never show up when you got it in the repair shop. They're only when you're using it. Yeah, the last time I took it down, we decided it just it just wants to take a walk. It's a laptop. No, it's a desktop. Have you opened it up to see if it's clean? It is. Uh, actually, it's just had the side off this morning, and all it's just fine. It sounds like it's and overheating a little bit. Have you checked to make sure? And this is the most important fan in the whole thing: is the fan on the processor. The fan on the prompt. I'll take a look at So that what you could do, now be careful, but you can have, if it's a desktop, you can have the side open. Don't stick your hands in there. But you can yeah. have the side open when you turn it on. And just look at the fan. There will be there are a couple of fans that are stuck onto the motherboard. There's one that's on top of the processor. It's probably uh -huh. the smallest fan in there. There may also be fans on some cards that are sticking up the video cards. You really want to make sure those are operating. What I'm hearing sounds exactly commensurate with overheating. Uh -huh. Whenever okay. your machine shuts down spontaneously, I mean, it, it, it could be other things. It's not, it's not software. It's not the operating system. And you could verify that simply enough by putting in, you know, getting a disk. Let's say you have your Windows uh, install disk. Better yet, get Linux on a disk. This is free. It's available. You can get one from Ubuntu.com, a CD. You can make one or you can get them to ship you one for free. You put that in the CD and you boot up. Now you're running an operating system. You can surf the web. You could do everything, but it's not running off the hard drive. It's running off that CD. It might be a little slow, but what it tells you is if there's a problem with the hard drive or the software on the hard drive. If the same overheating or the same shutdowns happen when you're running Linux off a CD, then we know it's not Windows. It's not anything you're running on, this, on the hard drive. It's not the hard drive itself. It's the hardware. It's the computer, which it almost certainly is. Um, and if your fan on the CPU were blocked, sometimes wires get in the way and the fan can't spin, or failed, or got unplugged, the CPU, the microprocessor, gets so hot so quickly, the computers are designed to shut down if they overheat. They actually, sh they actually shut themselves off to protect the system. And this sounds exactly like what's going on. Could be also a power supply blown. This is, a, this is much more common than uh, people realize. You know, you have, and be careful with it. You do not want to open the power supply. You can shock yourself badly.
But you, if you look in, in your tower case, you can't do this in a laptop, but you've got a case so you can do it. You open the side. You look at the tower case. There's a silver box with all the wires coming out. Usually it's at the top. There's a fan on the back of that. Make sure that fan's working. But these power supplies can go out. If they do, you'll also get these kind of intermittent problems. They can be overheating. Um, so if you see the fan on the CPUs operating normally, the fans inside are operating normally, there's no wires getting in their way, they're spinning, um, then I would, I would uh, go bring it back to your tech guy and say, can you replace the power supply? It's a cheap thing to replace, easy to replace. Wouldn't be a difficult thing to fix. Josh is calling all the way from Australia. Hey, Josh. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you knew any good... Uh, I've got a DSLR, five, the Canon 550D. I was wondering if you knew any good lenses for video. Well, you know, any lens that works uh, on your uh, DSLR, if your DSLR supports video, and most new ones do... Uh, will be great for video because you've got better lenses on this DSLR, far better lenses than on any camcorder, even an expensive camcorder. Uh, most camcorders don't have interchangeable lenses. You have to spend a lot of money to get a prosumer or, or professional camcorder to get interchangeable lenses. And even then, your choices aren't as varied as you have for that DSLR. So, and what you'll see is a lot of TV shows and movies are now being shot with Things like your 550, more commonly with the 5D Mark II or, uh, or the D3 from Nikon, now the D4, which just came out, which is incredible for video. And they'll use the same kind of lenses you'd use for still shooting. Uh, it's nice to have a lens with a low aperture, an f1.4, f1.8, f1.2 if you can afford it, because that'll give you something that professionals recognize and use. In fact, this is, if you see, it's called depth of field. And if you see movies or, or pictures with this kind of depth of field, you immediately say pro. Well, that's a pro. It's used all the time in major motion pictures. And let me describe what happens. Uh, normally on a point-and-shoot camera, everything's in focus. You know, the foreground, the background, everything. Same on your camera phone. Everything's in focus. With a, a high f-stop camera, you can get only one thing in focus, the rest out of focus. It's great for portraiture, great for movies. Highly recommended. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We dedicate this edition of Rawhide to Brent, uh, Burke and uh, Liz and uh, Russell, who are caravanning across the desert right now, driving all the gear back from the Consumer Electronics Show. And uh, what's nice is they put up a little... Um, you can get this from the chat room if you want to go to our chat room at techguylabs.com. They put up a little um, glimpse... Glimpse is neat of where they are. G L Y M P S E dot com. Glimpse lets you send a text message uh, to somebody saying, "Hey, oh, I'm running late. He, you know, here's you can follow me on the Google Maps at this link." So what Glimpse does is they take a Google Map and they put your GPS location on top of it, and you can watch in real time. I'm watching uh, Liz and Burke drive home. I can see when they they should be stopping for lunch any moment now. Chatroom says actually though no, no, they already stopped. And they could tell from the map it was either a Del Taco or an In-N-Out. <laughs> My guess is an In-N-Out. <laughs> what town are they going through right now? I can't, uh, I can't, it's not, it looks like a little town. I don't know what it is. No, it's just, just uh, the dead, they're in the Mojave Desert. 8888, I'm not spying on my employees. They put that up. I didn't, I didn't tell them they had to put it up. Although I'm glad they did. 80, <laughs> 8888 ask. Uh, Leo, that's my phone number, 888-827-5536. It really is, uh, I think, true that people are not going to be buying video cameras much anymore. To start with, you have a great camera, and almost any modern cell phone, from the iPhone 4S to any of these Android phones, you've got high-def video in your pocket all the time. I think that's why Cisco finally got out of the flip cam business. They killed the flip cam because, well, everybody's got a flip cam if you have a modern smartphone. They also, uh, on the high end, anybody who has a modern ca you know, camera, whether it's a, a digital point-and-shoot or a digital SLR, those are the fanciest ones, has a video capability. So, you know, if you've got a still camera with you, you've got a great camcorder in your pocket. And they're even making TV shows and movies with the high-end DSLRs like the Canon 5D. 1080p high-def video, and you've got all these great lenses. So that's why... 
choosing a lens. There's no, there's no one perfect lens for video. You choose the lens for the shot you're getting. And and since, it, you know, if you have a DSLR, you probably have at least one or two lenses. You have a the kit lens that came with a DSLR, with, which is usually a pretty good zoom. You might have a telephoto lens that gives you distant shots. You might have a wide-angle lens, which is great for landscapes or buildings. Or close-ups of parties and things like that. Wide angle is great for that. And then I just love the idea of having a very fast lens, a lens that lets in a lot of light for two reasons. One, because you can shoot in, you know, indoors without having to set up lights. Lights add a lot of cost to all of this stuff. So it's nice not to have to set up lights. It's not so... It means you can be on the move and running around. Plus, you get, as I was saying, great depth of field. I wish I had a better way to describe depth of field. I have to work on this. The idea is of depth of field is um, when you have a camera with a big aperture, a big opening, lets in lots of light, and they measure the opening with a, a term called f-stop, which is kind of confusing because it's, it's inverse. The smaller the f-stop, the bigger the opening. So there are cameras uh, with f-stops. Your digital point-and-shoot usually is f4 or thereabouts. But if you get a fancy, fancy, expensive lens, you can go down to even f1, which means it's letting a ton of light. One of, but one of the consequences of opening up the lens like that is, it's, is the focal plane gets very shallow. So a pinhole camera, for instance, with a tiny, 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 tiny opening, everything's in focus. It's all perfectly focused because the opening is so small. As you increase the opening, the area that can be in focus gets smaller and smaller. And when you get to f1.2, for instance, it's just a few millimeters thick. So much so that if you're using a wide open f1.2 to take a portrait and you focus the camera on the person's tip of a person's nose, their eyes will be out of focus. Even an inch away, they'll be out of focus. So if you're using a camera like that, you usually focus on the eyes and everything. And then the nose kind of gets a little out of focus, but depending on how big their nose is, but that's, you know. That is what, if you had a single thing that made pictures look professional, that was kind of a, a cue to your viewers that you're a pro, it would be that. Portraiture done with wide open lenses, with big, uh, you know, with low F stops, with big, big openings. Uh, the, the, the person is in focus, but the background kind of turns into blur. And it's, it just looks much nicer. And, and it also tells you, look at the person, not what's going on behind them. And when you do that on video, you look like a professional cinematographer. Because normally people, even with camcorders, good camcorders, you can't do that. You, you know, something's in focus, but, but, but the stuff that's not in focus is not really out of focus. You can kind of tell what it is. That makes a big difference. So if, if you're picking a lens for videography on your digital SLR, I like the idea if you can afford it because these, these lenses are much more expensive. The, the bigger the opening, the lower the f-stop number, the more expensive the lens is, more difficult it is to make. If you can afford it, get a wide open lens, a 1.4, a 1.8, or if you really are you're, you're rolling in the dough, a, an f1.2, and boy, it can do some beautiful stuff. Let's go to uh, line five right now. Glenn is in Rancho Cucamonga. Hello, Glenn. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, what an honor and a privilege to talk to you. Sir. Well, it's my privilege, too, because I tell you what, Glenn, if, if people don't call, this is a very boring show. You know, I just want to tell you, um, I'm a longtime listener of the, of the show here at KFI, the more stimulating talk radio. Thank you. But my son, when he was back in the fifth and sixth grade, Remembers uh, watching you on Tech TV. That's right. Way back when, 1998 to 2004, I hosted a couple of shows, Call for Help and the Screensavers. Right. And, you know, it's funny. At CES, I met a ton of people in their 20s who said, I, I grew up watching you. <laughs> it made me, made me feel old, but it also made me happy. Well, he's in his senior year at college now. Fantastic. Now I listen to you on the radio. Is he a good geek? He is the best geek. <laughs> we turn well. I have to say, I don't know if it's good, but I, I take credit for turning a lot of people into geeks over the years. <laughs> the, you know, I just want to say thank you too for being out there and being our direct conduit to the cyber universe. My pleasure. I it's I have the best job in the world, at least for me. But what can I? But enough enough praise. Thank you. But what, but what can I do for you, Glenn? 
Well, Leo, I got the um, recently. I I picked up the uh, LG Thrill 4G uh, uh-huh. smartphone. Ah, the Thrill. I, yes, and I would like to uh, utilize that phone as a GPS tracker for the company vehicle. Ah, well, we were just talking about something that's kind of like that. Um, yeah, it's called Glimpse. Now, this isn't um, a full-time tracker, but it can be used uh, for individual trips. If you've got somebody going out and you want to see where they are, uh, they can establish a Glimpse account and set this up. It's very easy to use. Uh, essentially, you download the app. Your Thrill is an Android phone. It'll work fine on that. They also have an iOS app. Uh, and, and what you do is you start your Glimpse from the app. And you say how long it'll last. And, and that's something important for Glimpse because uh, people are concerned about, well, gosh, am I going to let somebody follow me around everywhere from now on? No, the time, they time out. So you can say only get to, they only get to watch me for 15 minutes or they only get to watch me for 10 minutes or an hour or three hours. I'm not sure what the maximum is. I think it's a few hours. But during that time... Anybody, you don't have to have the Glimpse software, can watch you on the web, see where you are, track your speed. It works really, really well. G-L-Y-M-P-S-E dot com. And it's free. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Now, I'm trying to think why you played this, Kyle Benham, our musical director. Every song, every song has a meaning. If you could only decipher it, it's kind of a code. He lives by the sea. I don't know. It shows how young you are. It shows how young I am. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't even, I guess I'm little Jackie Paper. So I did say I would talk a little bit about iPad 3 rumors. Let me qualify everything I'm about to say with uh, the, uh, the caveat that I always give, and I have to give, that rumor is not real. Rumor is rumor. And uh, in the case of Apple, almost always untrustworthy. <laughs> no one knows. Apple doesn't say, and no one knows what the iPad 3 is going to be. However, however... Uh, the best source of these rumors turns out to be the Taiwanese companies that supply the hardware, the pieces, the parts to Apple. They would know, wouldn't they? Because after all, they have to, uh, they have to, they sell this stuff ahead of time and they don't, you know, I mean, Apple's, I'm sure selling, you know, making them sign papers as they don't reveal it, but it's awfully, you know, the more people who keep a secret, the, the less likely the secret's going to be kept. So if you believe Digitimes, which is a Taiwanese uh, newspaper that covers the, the parts industry, the next tablet is already in manufacture, heavy manufacture, like crazy manufacture. It will have, it will be a little bit thicker. Why? Well... Because it's going to have a quad-core processor, double battery life. That's one of the reasons you'd make it a little bit thicker. The more space you have, the bigger the battery. Double. Now, 20 hours of battery life would be incredible. They might need it, though, because they say this will support 4G LTE cellular data networks. We're starting to see both... Verizon and AT&T roll out their LTE networks. There were LTE networks in Las Vegas for CES. They're incredibly fast. 20 megabit downloads when nobody else is using it, even when they're congested. 10 megabit downloads. Really fast. Faster in many cases than your home connection. So imagine an iPad with 20 hours battery life. Oh, did I mention the new Retina display? A much higher resolution display, twice as fast because of the quad-core chip, twice the battery life, twice the screen resolution, and more than twice the speed because of the LTE networks. Now, what would you say? <laughs> Apparently, factories in China are currently running at 24-hour schedules, manufacturing these. 
Apple does have an event coming up in a couple of weeks. I don't think that event's going to be the iPad 3 announcement. Although it could, they, you know, now that these rumors are coming out, if they're true, Apple may rush, even if they're not, especially if they're not, Apple may rush to make an announcement to kind of quell these rumors. According to the folks who are saying this, the, the release day will be March. Just three months, two months from now. Wow. I would say this is all fairly credible. Uh, Apple's not known for jumping on any bandwagons, especially high-speed data networks. They were very slow to adopt 3G. They still don't have 4G for their phones. But, you know, both Verizon and AT&T are really making uh, these, these LTE networks fast. So I'm thinking now might be the time to do it. A retina display would be incredibly expensive and battery uh, hogging, too. That's why you'd need a bigger battery. But, boy, wouldn't you love... I mean, the display on the iPad right now is not as high quality as uh, a good number of the other uh, companies' displays. It's very tempting to think of a retina display, the kind of display you have on the iPhone now, on a 10-inch screen. Wow. Now, here's the other thing that's interesting. We saw a lot of tablets at CES, and a lot of them, most of them, were cheaper, much than the iPad. Uh, we saw a tablet from, um, I think it was Samsung. I'm trying to remember the company. That was $250 for a phone and a tablet together, if you buy both together. Nice tablet, too. So prices are getting, uh, they're getting a lot of pressure, not just the Kindle Fire, but other companies are really putting pressure on Apple price-wise. So this is the final part of the rumor. Apple will, of course, charge at least as much as they already charge for an iPad 3, but they'll use that opportunity to continue to offer the iPad 2 at a much reduced price. And that way, they'll keep some of that market. So let's say a $300 or maybe a $250 iPad 2, a $500 to $600 iPad 3 available in March. If that's all true, expect an announcement from Apple fairly soon. That's a, it's exciting. I don't know if it's true. Remember, did, don't you remember? I said right at the beginning, don't believe a word I'm about to say. Didn't I say that? I want to believe, though. Don't you? <laughs> I really want to believe. All right, let's take a break. I'm going to take another phone call here in just a second. Gary's on the line from Lake Forest. He wants some advice on uh, buying a camera uh, for eBay sellers. It, pictures are really important if you're on eBay. Gary, Lake Forest, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Gary. Hello, Leo. Um, I'm looking for a recommendation for an older digital SLR that I can buy used and fairly cheap that would make a good camera for shooting items to be sold on eBay. Anything about 4 megapixels would probably be okay, but I need good white balance and a decent lens that would give me good close-ups. Not extreme close-ups, but with nice depth of field that I just can't seem to get with the point-and-shoots. Yeah, that's very good. I think you're exactly right. Now, of course, also important is lighting. And um, right. most of the people I know who really want great close-up pictures of products um, will create a um, what they call a soft box. And it's easy to do. We talked about it last yeah. week with Chris Marquardt. Yeah, I have two of them. I have two of them, so, uh, two sizes. Perfect. So you get you basically you take a box, you line it with wax paper or something that kind of diffuses the light. You put the lights outside, right. and then you get a nice, smooth, even light all around the product. But now, and you need a tripod, of course. You could use a Gorilla Pod, right. or you could even put it on books. But you need something to hold that camera still. And then you're right. I think having a good camera with a with a good lens, there should be a variety of DSLRs online that would do the job. Uh, yeah, I know. Picking one is the problem. That's why I called you. Well, I'd like a, a camera that is discontinued but is a very good camera. It's still out there. It's the Nikon D70. You should right. you should be able to find that pretty cheaply on eBay. Uh, okay. I think a Canon uh, EOS T1. Uh, would be probably uh, out there pretty cheaply. Did you say EOT like Tom? EOS and then T. -E See, they the current uh, EOS is a T two I, but okay. the original uh, e or actually T three I think, but the original T one, the Canon Rebel, uh, was the first affordable digital camera at around six hundred bucks with a good lens. And I bet you there's a number of people who've stepped up. See, you're in a good position because anybody who's getting going to the next level with their photography is going to want to sell that old camera. Right, and I don't need the latest and the greatest for this task. 
The original uh, Rebels were the XT or the XTI. I bet you an XT or an XTI would be perfect. A T1I, it came after that. They'd be good. They'd be good. Uh, the D550 that the caller was calling about, that would be good. Maybe even more than you need. I, I think the D70 or the XT, the D70 from Nikon or the Canon XT, those are going to be great cameras, just what you want. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, and a whole lot more. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. We're talking about uh, all the digital doodads that we saw at the computer, uh, the consumer Electronic shows, not the computer electronic show. In fact, I don't think there were very many computers in sight there, except that there were everywhere. Huh? Is that a riddle? Yeah, kind of. Uh, there, you know, Intel announced uh, its ultrabooks, and a lot of companies showed these ultra light laptop computers, but they were hardly the most interesting things at the show. And yet, everything at the show that was interesting had a computer in it. It's just they weren't in the form of a computer. The, the OLED TVs and the smart TVs, well, we saw a ton of smart TVs. TVs that, like computers, run apps, have keyboards, are connected to the Internet. But they're television sets from Samsung, from LG. LG had some great ones. LG had one with Google TV that I just loved. And these are, in many cases, have dual-core gigahertz plus processors in them. They are computers running operating systems, usually Linux running applications, uh, doing a lot of the things you'd expect a computer to do, except it's hanging on your wall. That, that was, if there were one trend at, at CES that was the big trend, it was smart television, internet-connected television. And you know, I love that because I'm an internet broadcaster. Yeah, I do this radio show, and I love it. It's, I've been doing radio for 36 years uh, and love radio. It's, you know, my first love. It's my favorite medium. It's intimate, it's real, it's, uh, it's authentic, it's inexpensive to produce, and yet it can change the world as we've learned. But I also love the democracy that you find on the Internet. Anybody can have a radio station, a TV station, a book, a magazine, a movie, and distribute it over the Internet using inexpensive technologies to create it, reach a global audience for next to nothing. And if you don't think that's changing the world of broadcasting, oh, baby, you're not paying attention. It's changing everything. And as an Internet broadcaster, you know, we, we have, a, in effect, an Internet television station. It's called Twit, This Week in Tech. You can see it at twit.tv. It's live almost all the time. We did a wall-to-wall -wall live coverage of CES, for example, Monday through Friday. We were there broadcasting live from our sky booth at CES. The CES folks loved having us there. I think that's the future of television. And when you, but you need to have a TV that can get on the Internet and a way to navigate the Internet so that you can find Twit and watch it on your big screen TV. And that's what's happening. So people uh, like me, we, we were kind of wandering in the wilderness for years. I've been doing uh, Internet broadcasting for uh, ages. But it's now. Now it's starting to happen. And you got to believe ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, they're all terrified. <laughs> they're, all, they're trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, I was very proud of uh, one part of my team. We have a newsroom uh, that's uh, just fantastic, headed by our news director, Tom Merritt. We hired him from CNET uh, well over a year ago. And uh, Sarah Lane and Ayaz Akhtar are two, uh, two uh, correspondents. The three of them host a daily news show on my Twit network called Tech News Today, TNT, every afternoon around about 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. They they up they give you all the tech news and analysis, a 45-minute show. It's a great show. And I was very proud of them because they just won the very first International Association of Web TV Awards. We're at the CES this week, and they won Best News Show against some very tough competition. So I'm very proud of them. They have an IWTV award, which we will put on the set. <laughs> Highlight, light up. Jason Howell, the producer, actually really deserves credit, too, because Jason Howell is also a big part of that show. 
So you're right. Thank you. Chat room said, what about Jason? Of course. So Tom Merritt, Ayaz Akhtar, Sarah Lane, Jason Howell, congratulations. Winners of the IAW TV Award for Best News Show of the Year for, for Web TV. And this is just the beginning. I'm very excited about what's happening uh, in, in Internet broadcasting. And you should be, too, because it, it gives us all a much bigger variety of programming. If you're into a niche like, you know, if you're a geek and you like technology like this show, or if you like horse racing or knitting or Pez dispensers, whatever niche you like, there's something for you. And as, as these shows grow in audience, grow in quality, uh, and 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 more and more people get the ability to watch these. Uh, this is the future of television. Absolutely, the future of television. And it won't be very long. And it's gonna. It scares people. <laughs> it scares broadcasters. But it won't be very long before you'll have five shows you love that are not on the major networks, that are more about things you care deeply about than broadcast networks are interested in. They need mass audiences. They can only do stuff that 18, 20, 30 million people will watch. That's fine. That's great. And we're all going to be watching the NFL playoffs today and the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks, of course. But if you're really into underwater basket weaving, there will be a show for you. Uh, your favorite comics. Look at Louis C.K. Well, this is a great example. You, you, ever, you know who he is. He's a wonderful comic. Uh, who has already built an audience thanks to broadcast. He had a television show on Fox, Louis uh, so he has a big audience. But he did something very interesting. He decided instead of producing his next comedy special with Comedy Central or HBO, to do it himself. He spent a quarter of a million dollars, got a theater, sold tickets, covered that cost, by the way, with the tickets he sold. And then, instead of selling it for a million bucks to HBO or Comedy Central, he put it on the Internet for $5.00. And asked his fans to download it. And, and not only to download it, but uh, he didn't put any copy protection on it. So he also asked his fans, he said, and by the way, <laughs> do me a favor. Uh, don't pirate this. Don't distribute it. Just, you know, pay for it if you like. It's cheap, five bucks. I haven't seen the most recent numbers, but the last time I checked, which is a couple of weeks ago, online sales of his special at five bucks a pop over a million dollars. He made more money than he would have made had he sold it to any big network. More people watched it. 220,000 people watched it. It wasn't pirated. And not only that, he made so much money that he's taking a quarter million dollars of it, actually $280,000 of it, and donating it to charities that his audience told him to donate it to. The Fistula Foundation... The Green Chimneys, Charity Water, the Pavlov Foundation, and Kiva all are going to get $280,000. He's going to keep $220,000, and the rest pays off his expenses and goes to his team. This is a huge success, and it's just the beginning. Yeah, you say, a lot of people say, oh, well, only Louis C.K. could do it because he has an audience. Well, I could point to a lot of people like Justin Bieber who didn't have an audience but used the Internet to find an audience. I think this is just the beginning. And yes, he can repeat it. Not only will he repeat it, I think many others will. I think we're in a very exciting time. And I think that's why those Internet TVs with apps are so important. Because you still want to sit in your living room and watch a big screen TV. You just want to be able to choose the content you want and not have the gatekeepers at CBS and NBC and ABC and, and Fox choose what you watch. We get to choose. It's, fa it's fantastic news. And it's happening right now. We're getting to watch it. And I love it. Michael, Los Angeles, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Michael. Hey, really a great show. I love you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I love you too, man. In, in, the, in a manly way. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I have a home theater system that I just set up. I just bought a Denon 1912, but it doesn't have Wi-Fi. But in my home, I do have a Wi-Fi network set up. Oh, I love what you, you're, you're talking right up my alley, exactly what we were just talking about. Hang on, Michael, because I have to take a break. When we come, we do have to pay some bills here. But when we come back, I will explain all. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Why don't we step outside and change our view? We don't see eye to eye. Sometimes it's true. 
Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. In about half an hour, we're going to say hello to Dick D. Bartolo, our giz whiz and gadget meister. He's Mad Magazine's maddest writer for the last 40 years, 40 plus years. And he was at CES and had some great stuff for us. He does a podcast on the Twit Network called The Weekly Daily Giz Whiz. And uh, they collected a bunch of great stuff at CES. So we'll, we'll get some of those uh, things. A preview in about half an hour. Meanwhile, though, we, we started talking to Michael in Los Angeles. And I apologize, Michael, for having to put you on hold. You, you got, you've already got your Wi-Fi network. Yes, sir. But what you want to do is, is make your TV receive from that network effectively. Well, I want my Denon 1912 to be connected to the network, but it only has an Ethernet. entry way for an Ethernet cable, yeah. but not Wi-Fi. Right. Your Denon is an AV receiver. That's actually the best way to connect it, because if the Denon's on the Internet, then everything's on the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are a couple of ways to do this. There are uh, Wi-Fi to wired bridges. It's just a, it's a little Wi-Fi receiver that plugs into the Ethernet port, basically. You program it by connecting it to a computer that's on the Wi-Fi network, and you say, this is the address, this is the password. Then you unplug it from the computer, you plug it into the Denon, it'll work fine. That's the okay. easiest way to do it. It just it's basically turns the Denon into a Wi-Fi device. I would get the one, for whoever makes your router, I'd get that same brand. Usually they work best that way. So okay. if, if you have Linksys, get a link. Everybody makes them, though. It's called an Ethernet bridge. Ethernet bridge. Yeah. And I'll still be able to connect my computers, oh, like yeah. my Blu-ray player, and everything else Do to the Internet. doesn't Wi -Fi. change anything. Uh, okay. Cisco makes, or Linksys makes one called the WET11. You know, actually, it's nice because you can reposition the antenna because it's you know it's connected uh, to the Ethernet port on a cable, so you can actually move it around to you get the best reception. So that's actually kind of nice. Okay. The other way to do it, a lot of people do this as well, is power line networking. This is hit or miss, uh, but it's gotten much better, and that's using your electrical wiring to send data. And if it works, it will be faster than Wi-Fi, but it's a little more expensive. You have to get a um, you, next to your router, you know where you connect the wireless router where you connect it to the internet. That usually has an Ethernet port on that. You connect that to this power line thing that plugs into the wall, and then you have another wall wart next to the TV that has Ethernet coming out of it. And it'll work fine as long as you, you know, have good wiring in the house. It's, it's relatively modern wiring. If you don't have a junction box in between the two points, which most people don't, most people have a single fuse box. Okay. But power line networking, that's called. It's more expensive. Um, right. But uh, it will be faster when it works. Okay. And you said the first one was called... Uh, what a, again? a wireless right. Ethernet bridge. Wireless Ethernet bridge. I probably would do that one. My, my, who makes, who makes your Wi-Fi router? Uh, Netgear. Yeah, so get a, Netgear makes these. Just get a net, okay. Netgear Ethernet bridge. That's the easiest. That was... Pretty simple. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Michael. I'm glad you called. Sorry I had to put you on hold, but, you know, commercials call. Apple, if you have an Airport Extreme, there's an Airport Express. Same thing. You have the Airport Extreme. You go down the hall with the Airport Express. It's connected to the network. It has Ethernet out. You put that into the Denon or your TV. Wired is faster and uh, more reliable. Wi-Fi, I use Wi-Fi all the time. I'm, you know, I use a Roku box. Um, I, it's just too much trouble for me to... <laughs> To string a wire from my uh, router to the TV. So I just, I, you know, Roku has Wi-Fi. Most of these boxes, BoxyBox, the Google TV, they're all Wi-Fi. Xbox, they're all Wi-Fi. It works fine. Airport Express does not have Ethernet out? I thought it did. Well, maybe it's Ethernet in. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. What do you do if you have an Airport Extreme? Is there a way to do this for an Airport Extreme? The good news is Wi-Fi is a standard it's best to buy it from the same manufacturer, but if your company, like Apple, doesn't make one of these, uh, then um, you probably can use a third-party Ethernet bridge just fine. Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. Pretty straightforward. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number if you have a question or a comment or a suggestion. If you've got a better way to do things. We love hearing from you uh, there, too. And, of course, the chat room is a good place. I get a lot of feedback. I'm always watching the chat room. They, they tell me everything. They tell me what I'm doing wrong. They put links in the chat room. All sorts of stuff. And you get in there by going to our website, techguylabs.com, and clicking the chat link. And, oh, by the way, uh, James is also in there, our, our, uh, our annotator, the secretary of the show. 
and he gets a lot of the links from the chat room, puts them in our show notes. They're also at techguylabs.com. Now, see, somebody in the chat room says the Airport Express can work as a wireless bridge. Maybe, you, maybe it's a newer one you need to do that. That's right. Stamps.com doesn't have Mac software for download. It's on, on the website. That's right. But, it, but you can use the website just fine. You know, this, I love this. USB scale is so fun. I just weigh things just for fun. Uh, let's see. Bert in Minnesota. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Bert. Hello, Leo. Welcome to the show. What can I do for you? Well, um, so the issue is I have about a three-year-old HP laptop. Um, powers up but will not boot to Windows. I was wondering if I could actually take that hard drive out and put it in an enclosure and possibly be able to get the data off it that way. Yeah, in most cases you can. It just depends how hard HP made it to open up the case. You can see if you look on the bottom, uh, there probably is a, as a kind of a port with two screws, like a door. Yep, that's there. Yeah, remove the screws. See if you can see the hard drive and if it's easy to pop it out. Sometimes you remove the battery and it's there. If it's easy to remove it, no problem. Just pop it out. You'll have to get an adapter that, if it's not a SATA drive, that powers it and gets data. It just depends on the kind of laptop drive you've got in there. Older laptop drives, you had to get a special connector that gave it both power and data. Newer drives, you don't need to do that. Um, you just need a special cable that will fit that drive. And you plug it into your computer. You can get data off of it. And most importantly, uh, you can put a new drive in there because I have a feeling... As long as the hardware is okay, which it sounds like it is, just you got a bad drive, and that's easy to replace and not too expensive. Yeah, I thought you had showed on the uh, an enclosure that you recommended a couple weeks back. That, yeah, um, it just depends. Is it how how recent is the laptop? It's about three years old. Uh, probably, uh, you just need a uh, cable that translates the. On the laptop drives, and the chat room, help me out on this. On the newer laptop drives. Uh, it's not the, the, the they're SATA, but it's just a different kind of SATA, and so you just need a cable adapter that goes from that to the the larger SATA that's on your on your uh, desktop. If you have an older drive, an older IDE drive, that was a little different. Then you have to get a uh, enclosure that's designed for laptop drives. Oh, okay. It just depends right. on on it. When you take it out, HP uses standard SATA, even simpler. So you don't even need an adapter. You just take out the drive. You can put it in your PC. It, it'll sit there. You know, it won't. It, it's you know, you got a bigger cage than the laptop drive is only two and a half inches, but that's fine. It doesn't. You're only doing this temporarily. Just make sure you don't short out any circuitry. Uh, make sure that circuit board is not touching any metal. Very good, Leo. All right. Thanks for the call. Uh, Jonathan in Whittier, California. Jonathan Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Hey. I am trying to help my family set up a Skype connection with our piano teacher. To awesome. Teach For piano them. lessons. Hey, I'll help you do that right after this. We've got to take a break. That's a great idea. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, we're in the San Francisco Bay Area, so as you might imagine, there's a little bit of interest in the game that's about to start. I don't want to send anybody over to the TV, but uh, there, there'll be some people in the studio who will not be paying any attention for the next half hour. <laughs> But we geeks, we, we soldier on because really, there's nothing more important than gadgets and technology, is there? No, siree. We were talking to Jonathan in uh, Whittier, California. This is a great idea. I know there's a guy in L.A. who gives uh, lessons in uh, electronic music and logic, in fact, via Skype. So I know you can totally do this. I bet you there are a lot of piano teachers and others who use Skype. So you're trying to get this set up. Uh, for your piano teacher who is somewhere else? Actually, we're trying to set up for our end. He's already done it to New York before, and he lives down here. Okay. And now we'd like to do it to Texas. So, but, he, so he already has his set up, and you want to get the... Re which end are you trying to buy, the receiver or the sender? The, te the teacher end. or the pupil? The pupil end. Okay. So it doesn't matter so much if the pupil has a great camera or is able to, I mean, you know, really what matters is that you can see the teacher clearly, you can hear the teacher clearly, and more, you know, you can see the teacher's fingers and all of that. But let's get, the, let's get a good setup for your pupil. Uh, I, think, I think it's pretty straightforward, actually. Uh, the good news is this is very easy to do. Uh, Logitech makes extremely good USB cameras for Skype purposes. Are you on Windows or Mac? 
window. Even easier. Some of Logitech's uh, cameras are not designed to work with Macs very well. They don't have software. They'll all work with Macs, but they don't have the flexibility that you'll have on a PC. But all of their cameras, of course, work very well with PCs. So if you look at Logitech's webcams, um, okay. there are, a, 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 you know, the truth is if you they have a rundown of what the capabilities are. All of them are HD. They're very high quality. Uh, some of them have better mics than other ones, and that's obviously a mic is going to be a very important thing for you. Okay. Um, uh, I would say that let me let me look and see uh, which one I'm going to recommend. Um, I I would say you know depends on your price sensitivity. We believe it or not, frequently for our shows, use the less expensive uh, C525, which is about fifty dollars. But you could spend 100 bucks and get their top of the line, the C920. It's designed for high-def 1080p Skype calling. It does very good audio. It has stereo microphones. Um, if you want to save money, you can go down to the 910 or even lower. I, I'm really happy with all of these Logitech cameras, and I think they do exactly what you want to do. Okay, because we just did a test, uh, test run yesterday. Yeah. And we're using a Logitech camera older, maybe four or five years old. So yeah, the probably, new ones are uh, infinitely better. Four or five years is a is in lifetime. A lifetime. Get the new one. You got the Orbit or something like that. I mean, I used to broadcast this show on a Logitech webcam five years ago. I think we've come a long way. <laughs> so seriously, get the newest one. Uh, and the other thing that you don't have as much control over is um, is bandwidth. I have to say, um, people complain about Skype issues. It's almost always not the camera or the computer. It's the bandwidth. People think they've got more than they do. You know, they buy uh, from their cable company or their DSL provider uh, a bandwidth package that's 6 megabits or 10 megabits, and they say, I got 10 megabits. That's not the amount that matters. There's two numbers. 10 megabits, the bigger number, is the download speed. Who cares? It's the upload speed that matters. And if you if you you must have at least 384K. You probably really want more. The more upload speed, the better Skype will work, the better the sound will be. And nobody, most companies, do not provide much upload speed. They give you lots of download speed. And that's got to change because we're all using Skype now. We're all uploading to songs and uploading video. and stuff. So we need better upload speeds. If you could get a megabit from your Internet service provider, you're golden. I'd say 784 is what you want minimum. Three, you're gonna or seven, whatever it is, 796. What is it? I don't, I don't remember the multiples. 384 is what you don't want. So what's 384 times two? Is seven uh, 752? That's what you want. 762. That's what you want. 768. I don't know. <laughs> anything, anything lower than 768, and I think you're not gonna get great picture. Anything better than it, your picture will get better and better and better. We, by the way, spend thousands, probably three or four thousand dollars a month on our bandwidth here because we're an internet broadcaster. So I have uh, a fiber channel in here that's 100 megabits up and a DSL channel in here that's 35 megabits up and an ADSL2 channel in here that's one and a half megabits up and I need every bit of it. And that's why our Skype looks good. When <laughs> You'll see, in fact, in a few minutes, you'll see Dick D. Bartolo on here. And he looks great because he's got a lot of bandwidth and we got a lot of bandwidth. The more you get, the better. Absolutely critical. John, Los Angeles, California. You're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, John. Hi, Leo. It's so good to talk to you. I've enjoyed your show for such a long time. Thank you. Uh, my question is about social media and, oh, I just wanted to say, too, I shoot video on a DSLR, and for uh, you can just get a little $20 adapter, and you can use a lot of old Nikon, Pentax, Ooh. manual focus lenses yeah. that are really fast and really high quality. That's so like a one tenth the price. That's a very good point, because usually when you shoot video, it's all manual anyway. You don't need that's all right. the digital exactly. features of that lens. Yes. So right. you can get an adapter and buy uh, OM-1 lenses? Because people have a lot of film yeah. lenses. They don't want them anymore. Oh, yeah. Right. Make and sure, though, then here's the right. one risk, is older lenses sometimes can get mold in them. 
Right. You have to check them out first. Make sure they're good. Try them on your camera. Sometimes, uh, depending on if you have a full frame or a crop sensor, it might interfere with the mirror and stuff like that. But once you check it out, you have to do a little due diligence, make sure it works, but it's definitely worth the effort. I agree. I've, I've purchased an old... Uh I have an old OM-1 50mm 1.4 lens that I got and yes, with an adapter on my yeah. uh, Micro Four Thirds, mm -hmm. and it looks fantastic. Yeah, I have a Super Tacomar uh, Pentax, same thing, mm -hmm. and it's wonderful. Yeah, really good. Highly recommend. Thank you for reminding me, John. That's absolutely right. That's <laughs> that's it's no you know it's a little risky because you're buying from eBay and you, you know you don't necessarily know what right. the quality is, but boy, if you get the you can get such good deals because nobody wants film cameras anymore. Yeah, you <laughs> sad know, to you say. Pick it up for like fifty bucks. It's yeah. a lot better than a thousand. I agree. And you don't need all those digital features on uh, on video. But exactly. Thank you. I appreciate that tip. Now, what can I do for you? Okay. Uh, well, this kind of goes along with what you were talking about earlier. Uh, my question is about social media, and I'm trying to build, uh, to find an audience, as you said. Um, I'm an independent science fiction uh, writer. Awesome. And I've published uh, books on, you know, Amazon for the Kindle. And I've been using Twitter, you know, my blog. Um, Google Plus. You know what I'd recommend? Do you know, there, have you ever heard a guy named Scott Sigler, S-I-G-L-E-R? No. Okay, look him up. What's, Scott Sigler is a uh, uh, science fiction author, really talented guy, kind of horror science fiction vein. And um, he had the same issue. He was writing great novels, couldn't get a publisher to save his life. He did something really interesting. He was one of the early podcasters. He started reading one chapter of a, at a time of his novel and put it out as a podcast. And oh, right. he found a huge audience, built an audience. And, of course, he used Facebook and Twitter, as you say, to build an audience. Now he's got a publisher, but he, in fact, he's decided to do it himself and makes more money that way. He's doing great. Look him up. You'll see he's a great role model. I couldn't, I couldn't pull the real version, so we got to go quick. Uh oh, <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Love. You know what we saw? Oh my goodness! And I got a highly recommended. I was at CES, and I try to take one night of the week, which is a grueling, hard-working week covering the Consumer Electronics Show. I try to take one night off. Thursday night, I took four or five of my staff to see the Beatles' Love, which is a Cirque du Soleil production in Vegas. It's at the Mirage. Dick, have you seen that? No, I've seen other productions, but not that. I love Cirque anyway. This is yeah. the best Cirque du Soleil. There is this oh, wow. blew my mind. George Martin, the Beatles' uh, original producer, remixed a bunch of Beatles songs for it. They sound incredible. I've never heard them sound so good. Uh, and, and so it's original Beatles, all the original Beatles music with beautiful, uh, it kind of, um, dan it's not as much uh, of an acrobatic show as many Cirque du Soleil shows are. It was just beautiful uh, envisioning of this, of this music. And Great. it was on, it was, if you're in Vegas, if you get a chance, go see the Beatles' uh, love at Cirque du Soleil. Unbelievable. It was better than I nice. expected. It's just, it's just great. Nice. Dude, you got your invitation to join us, right? Oh, uh, I was on my way home. So. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, I, yeah, I, I know, I know. No, because they called first and said, are you going to be there Thursday? And I said, uh, no, I leave Thursday. And they said, oh, okay, great. That's the night to get there. <laughs> so, I, know so, you have to, I know you have to cut corners and it's like 100 bucks a seat. 200. I totally understand. 200. 200. Is 200. it 200? Well, it was, we had good seats. Oh, but it was okay. worth it. Get the good seats. Oh. Anyway, okay. um... Dick D. Bartolo, that's the voice you hear. He is a Mad Magazine's maddest writer, has been since 1927. He's yeah, just... 1925. Five. No, I'm 25. not kidding. You always get it mixed up. Since the 60s, though, and I grew up reading your stuff. You're the usual gang of idiots. That's him. That's and one of And a few them, others, yeah. 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 And uh, he also happens to be, since day one, a crazy gadget hound. And he's we, we call him the Gizwiz. His website is gizwiz.biz. And he joins us every week to talk about gadgets. And, of course, he hosts a podcast called The Weekly Daily Gizwiz, which is coming up on our Twit Network. It won't be uh, it won't be live. It won't be me. It'll be you and Sarah at uh, Showstoppers. Showstoppers. Is, yeah, we walked around. And uh, Nicole sent me the list because we were just winging it, walking through. Well, that's the fun part. Poor Hilton walking backwards for one a and a half guy. hours <laughs> <laughs> trying not to fall. I can't wait to see people. it. Did you, did you get some good stuff? We did. Uh, you know what my favorite thing was? A, a, a new shredder from Swing Line. Now, you like you know, shredders. I don't know why, but you, so I, Swing know, Line's like a staple company. I have so many file drawers full of 
tax documents that are, you know, beyond right. seven years. And it's a real drag to sit there and... And it's really important because of identity theft not to just throw this stuff out. You really... Yeah. In fact, you shouldn't... You should do a cross-cut shredder, right? Yes, cross That makes, cut, co makes confetti, confetti out of it. Confetti, yes. But there's this new uh, shredder called Stack and Shred... So, Leo, what you do is you load it like you're loading paper into a printer. Oh, you nice. You put 20 or 40 or I believe it's 60 sheets into the sheet loader, close the cover, and then go have lunch, go do what you oh, want. Oh, hallelujah. Finally. And this, yes, exactly. And the woman told me a couple of interesting things. She said it, it runs at a much slower speed since you don't have to sit there feeding right. it, and it's less apt to jam. Yeah, because you don't, yeah. you know, the worst thing would be come home and, and 30 pages in the thing jammed. So you really want it to kind of just do it well. Exactly. Yeah. But she also said there's a little uh, mechanism in there that if, it, if there's a jam, it knows to reverse the motor a couple times to clear the jam on its own. It's, it says so it does up to 100 sheets. Yeah, and they wow. make them up to 500 sheets if you have an office. Wow, well, I have an office. I've heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, for a home, I think 60 sheets is fine. Oh, absolutely. That's a stack and shred from a... Uh, How much is one. that? You know, um, 160 bucks. Yeah, good price. Yeah, not bad at all. Um, oh, you know what? We have to thank your friends at Stamps.com. Do you know what they did? What? They let every person at the show, I guess you didn't know about it, send home one medium flat rate box full of stuff. Oh, that's and great. Stamps Yes, I took all my little gadgets, and before I flew home, I filled a box with them, went up to stamps.com, and the, the box came this morning. So 48 hours. It was great. That's, gosh, you, you know, you get so much stuff at CES. Yeah. Uh, we had sent so, a van so, down there, so all the stuff, and I, I literally armfuls of, of stuff that I got, brochures, information, samples, I just put in the truck, so it'll come here someday. Oh, yeah. yeah. Lucky you. Uh, lucky yeah. me. Exactly. So well, that's nice of Stamps yeah. to do that. That's great. Yeah. But I guess the most talk at the show was, and I think you saw it too, was the LG OLED 55-inch oh, TV. Gorgeous TV. Samsung Leo, had one too. Do you know too. how much that TV weighs? No. 16 and a half pounds. It's four millimeters thick. Thick. That's less than your pinky thick. Yes. And 55 inches, an astounding picture. Uh, no price yet, coming in the fall. I uh, think this so is a transformation of television. Now, uh, I talked to some experts, and their LG yeah. and Samsung both had one. I love the LG TVs. I love the uh, LGs using Google TV as their smart uh, hub, which I think is great. I love the remote control. But a number of people told me the Samsung display is going to be the better of the two. Really? Because they're they're uh, not they're not doing well. It's very technical, but there's a technology called subpixel rendering that LG's using that Samsung's not using. Oh, okay. Just to, okay. but I, they both looked equally good to me. So I guess we'll yeah, have to judge to when me, they come out. To me too. Yeah. yeah. Really. And then nice. there's also a lot of talk about the Lenovo uh, Idea Pad Yoga. Yeah, I had a, they brought that up to the stage. It, it's a oh okay. It's an ultrabook, uh, but it folds the the lid folds back all the way. So it turns yes. into a tablet, not with a, you know, sometimes with these convertibles, you got to switch stuff around and things. The yoga, you just fold it right back. It goes all the way back, and you can have it at any position. So if you're watching a movie, you could use it to prop it up. It's really nice. Yeah, you can use nice the keyboard stuff. sort of as the stand. Yeah, yeah exactly. Pretty nifty. pretty nifty. We can so, find out anyway, more about then, all your... See, go ahead. Yeah, you'll see like 17 gadgets. Um, I, I think there's sort of a ranging at that. The, it's going to upload like in the next couple of hours so that you'll be able to see. Well, we're going to air it on the air live, too, uh, as if it's happening, Ooh. even though it's after the fact. Uh, and you could find out. So that's coming up right after the radio show at twit.tv, Gizwiz, and uh, the weekly daily Gizwiz with the lovely Sarah Lane, who is the, the crush of my life. She's so. Don't, did you enjoy <laughs> working with her? She is great. I've she worked with Sarah really for great. 10 years. I just adore her. She's one of my favorite people. You know that she and her team, Tom Merritt, Ayaz Akhtar, and uh, Jason Howell, won the IAW-TV Award for Best Web Newscast. I saw that. I was, was so proud really of that. really great. Yeah. yeah, I think you should be. It's, you, really, you really have an amazing team there. I do indeed. So, yeah, yeah. I do indeed. Well, Dick, we'll be uh, watching for the Weekly Daily Gizwiz 
episode 1349, which is from CES. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find out more at Dick's website, gizwiz.biz. And while you're there, play the What the Heck Is It contest, a chance to... Uh, this is a special uh, set of chicken foot bowling pins, I believe. But if you uh, know I, better... I never can comment on your... <laughs> <laughs> All you have to do is figure... Only because I don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> you got to figure out what that is. The truth is, getting it right is not the uh, idea. Twelve people get autographed Mad Magazines for the right answer. Up to 24 for the best cute answer. Go to gizwiz.biz yes. for your chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. We're all about cute here. <laughs> and Dick, welcome home from CES. It was so great to see you. So Thank great you. to have you. It was great you. fun being out there. And, and uh, it's really wonderful to walk in and see the Twit stage. And you feel like you're really part of a, a huge tech entity. We which, loved having so, you yeah. on our team. We did. Yeah. And the other thing is, I think you should do the Gizwiz with Sarah more often because uh, Sarah's not very tall. Uh, and I noticed that you're wearing your lifts, and you're still not very tall. <laughs> so <it's, laughs> when I do the show with her, it's I, I have to look. It's perfect. Actually, one oh. year we had her and Jason Howell do something, and you just couldn't figure out what the hell was going on because. Oh, I know. Well, even with Tom. Yeah. Yeah. She, she can. Tom can stand right behind her, and none of Tom's <laughs> head is blocked. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. Dick T. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's writer, maddest writer. Gizwiz.biz. Stay tuned for the weekly daily Gizwiz in just a bit. We're out of time. I can't believe how fast this went. But you know what? I do this show twice a weekend. And I do lots of shows all week long at twit.tv. I hope you'll join me next time. I'm Leo Laporte, the tech guy.